Nisha Dutt, who is Director of the Consulting Services at IntelliCap. Um, joining Nisha in this conversation today, we have uh, four panelists. Um, I'd like to call upon Mr. T.C. Ranganathan, who is Chairman and Managing Director at Ex Exim Bank. Mr. Ben White, who is the founder of VC for Africa. Ms. Jenny Everett, who is Associate Director at the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs. And finally, Mr. Harold Rosen, who is the CEO of Grassroots Business Fund. Thank you, Deepika. Okay. Thank you, Deepika. Um, so since the topic today is quite interesting, I think uh, the way I see the flow, um, in, in the morning we were talking about South-South collaboration, but that was more at impact investing level. And right now we are talking about SME linkages. So this is you know, more collaboration at enterprise level. So I think uh, this discussion should be interesting. Um, one of the things I'd like for the panel to do today is that we hear so much rhetoric around India-Africa collaboration and the potential of it, but very little seems to be getting done on the ground. So if we can take the uh, conversation beyond this just being an academic discussion and really talk about should we be transplanting ideas, entrepreneurs, what are we talking about when we talk about SME collaboration? Is it you know market creation? Is it trade of goods and services? So uh, what is a good starting point? Is it about information exchange? And if it is about all these things, then what is the best infrastructure that's needed? Who should take a lead on it? So I'd like to answer, um, so I'm hoping that by the end of this panel, we are able to collectively answer some of these questions. Um, so with that background, I'll ask each of you to briefly introduce yourselves, maybe not take, the more, take more than three minutes, introduce yourself, and also, you know, if you could make an opening statement on where do you see the most potential for linkages. Thank you. I'm Ranganathan. I represent Exim Bank of India. The basic mandate for Exim Bank of India is to promote export of Indian goods and services, promote diversification of Indian goods and services, promote internationalization of Indian companies and entrepreneurs who are importing Indian goods and services, and build relationships with various countries across continents in this endeavor. Africa is a very important continent for us and it holds a lot of promise. The Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the rap most rapidly growing segments. If you see Africa as a continent or Sub-Sahara as a segment and you compare it as India as another segment, certain similarities arise. On a GDP level, the GDP of those 52 odd countries in Indian GDP is almost similar. Population is almost similar. Land area is about eight times bigger. Per capita income is almost similar. Educational literacy levels, India is slightly ahead. In terms of Gini coefficients, equality levels, India is slightly ahead. So there are huge places in Africa which are more modern than India. There are huge places in India which are far poorer than Africa. If I'm trying to promote Indian goods and services, I'm trying to promote across the spectrum. And across the spectrum is from the most advanced to the most informal and from the most so there. And the way to promote is to A, improve the quality of Indian goods and services to the match up to the expectations create an environment from there. And if some competitive edge has to be done by capacity building or familiarization, do that. And we believe a partnership with countries is to foster linkages which becomes a win-win for both countries. And unless entrepreneurs in Africa are see a winning solution in using Indian goods and services, they will not buy it from India, they'll buy it from someone else. And we try to make sure that the winning solutions are available so that we can promote. Indian exports to Africa have gone up by 10 times in the last 10 years. And our share in African imports has gone up three times. But we are still a minor player. Our exports 
percentage share is only 7% of their imports. So there's a 93% they're importing from the rest of the world. And Indian needs to do much more. And that's the effort which is there. I think later on we can talk about it. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. <clears throat> so in 2006 or 2007, I attended the African Venture Capital Association meeting in Dakar, Senegal. And at that meeting, it was made very clear to me that there are essentially two ends of a, 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 of a spectrum. On one side, you have microfinance, and on the other side, you have private equity. And at that time, it was 100 million euro, 100 million dollar you know, uh, investments in large infrastructure, telecommunications, things like this. And then there was nothing in between. So we call this the SME, you know, the missing middle, the, the gap. Uh, you, there are many different terms um, that people use to describe this, this space. Um, and then specifically, we see that anything under one million is even harder to reach. Uh, and it's so perplexing to me because everywhere I go, I only meet entrepreneurs who are trying to build really great and wonderful companies, and I don't understand why they don't get the help that they need. So we look at this situation and say, okay, are we going to wait for government? Are we going to wait for multilateral institutions? Are we going to wait for somebody to come and solve this problem uh, or this, this challenge that, that we're faced with? And our approach is to say, well, any kind of change starts by building communities of entrepreneurs. So VC for Africa, Venture Capital for Africa, is a peer-to-peer -peer network of entrepreneurs who are building early stage companies across the African space. We have 10,000 members in 159 countries. All of them are under one million. Um, and essentially through a peer-to-peer -peer network, these entrepreneurs are connecting with all of the resources that they need as they go about building their venture. So don't think only about money, think about all of the non-financial related needs that an entrepreneur has in terms of mentorship, in terms of uh, finding a, a new employee to help with uh, technology, getting feedback on how to design uh, financial models, uh, et cetera. Understanding a term sheet. Um, what goes into a term sheet? What are the things I should be looking out for? So essentially, we are building all of these questions into a peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem where entrepreneurs can support one another, and at the same time, they make themselves visible to the rest of the world and in turn also make themselves more accessible um, to all of the people who are looking to support them. So think about uh, angel investors, small-scale uh, VCs, uh, accelerators, uh, SME financiers, um, and anyone else who is interested in, in accessing networks of entrepreneurs. So if we're, that's, that's the work that we do in the African context. I'm here because on, on invitation and to learn and understand the relationship between Africa and, and India as that's uh, evolving over time. I think my input into the conversation would be to look at how do you grow communities of entrepreneurs, how do you bring them online, and how do you then start to connect communities of entrepreneurs across ecosystems. Uh, if you look at India with a population of 1.1 billion people, if you take into account that 15% have access to internet, uh, and that these numbers are uh, scheduled to grow and are growing dramatically. I think this year alone, India will add 30 million people to the web. Uh, if you look at that population and you assume that maybe only 2% to 4% are entrepreneurs, maybe 8% to 16% follow as imitators, if you look at that potential target, um, the number of people that you could reach using and leveraging the web and mobile technology, I think it's significant. And that segment is certainly growing rapidly. So how do you take the conversations that are happening at a Congress like this, and how do you then make that accessible to the entire Indian population? Uh, and looking at how do you connect that ecosystem with the ones that we're building in other parts of the world that fosters this exchange between entrepreneurs and out in the end uh, results in a lot more uh, business and partnerships and investment and the things that we're all looking to see more of. Hi, I'm Jenny Everett. I'm with the Aspen Network of Development Entrepreneurs, or Andy. And so just a brief introduction for those of you who don't know us. I see several of our members in the room. But we are a network of 180 organizations globally that support what we call small and growing businesses and entrepreneurship in developing and emerging markets. So targeting the same level of business that Ben's been talking about, the missing middle, the pioneer gap. Um, we say SGBs. Um, and our, our 
role as an industry slash membership association is twofold. It's first to help our members do their jobs better in supporting entrepreneurs. So our members are a combination of investment funds, of capacity development providers, foundations, corporations, universities, sort of the whole ecosystem that goes into supporting small and growing businesses. And so a lot of what we do is around bringing these organizations together at both the local and regional level so that they can learn from each other and learn best practices and find ways to partner and um, shorten the learning curve for their own organizations. And then our second key purpose is to help build the sector. So we spend a lot of time on advocacy and education around the, the importance of small businesses, the roles that they play in society, the need for more resources, both going directly to businesses and to the intermediaries that support them. Um, so I clearly have a bias, <laughs> but, but you know, my view is that the best sort of approach to South-South South collaboration is from an ecosystem approach and realistically more from an intermediary approach than an entrepreneur approach. Um, and that's partially a capacity level, um, or a capacity issue. You know, an individual entrepreneur who's just trying to survive and get their business going, whether it's in India or Africa, realistically probably doesn't have the time and the capacity to be researching and figuring out what's going on in other continents. They need to be figuring out what's going on in their local market. Um, but I can think of lots of examples where our members who you know, are either providing capacity development support or investment support have the ability to look across markets and bring in some of those expertise. So I think that's probably the most realistic place. Um, I will say I'm, I'm a little hesitant on kind of this increased focus on South, South, South by South. I wonder to some degree if it's almost a little premature for our sector because I think there's so much learning that still needs to go on within countries and when if, within continents, and I don't want to skip over that and go immediately to, to learning across the South, though, of course, I see the, the benefits in understanding what's working in other markets and could be relevant for local markets. So I can discuss that more in the questions. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, so I'm Harold Rosen. I'm the founder and head of the Grassroots Business Fund. We are an impact investment fund that operates in four different locations around the world. Uh, East Africa and India are two of them. Uh, we have a for-profit but socially minded investment fund and a non-profit that supports capacity building and social impact enhancements around the projects that the fund invests in. Uh, we are uh, basically in a place like India, we do one and two million dollar per investment and also put a little bit of money out of our nonprofit to build the enterprises. Most places in the world, uh, including in Africa, we've been heavily focused on agribusiness. In India, we can talk about why this is, but it's not the subject of today's discussion. We actually haven't done much agriculture. It's been more artisanal and crafts type organizations. Uh, we, and I had worked in the World Bank Group IFC for a long time, so I've had a, a bit of uh, interest and in, uh, observation on this South-South story for quite a long time. Just a couple of types of linkages uh, in terms of defining a, our terms a little bit. Uh, clearly, there are big corporations in India that are absolutely world-class and human skills that are, sorry if this sounds condescending, absolutely first world. So these are things that I think Africa is still working on in many cases. So you have a, a corporate development and human stock in India is absolutely first world and is a, it makes it a huge potential. Uh, that's a great big difference and usually a trade or a movement depends on there being some complementary differences. Uh, Africa's got a big and underdeveloped agriculture but good opportunities so that would be an example of a good linkage. Uh, there's also that uh, besides the big corporations and the trade, uh, they, uh, trade and human expertise, the models and innovation. I think it's pretty clear India is probably the epicenter of innovation in the social investment space. Uh, that's another thing where India is crying out for these kind of models. So in terms of social businesses and innovative business models that help a lot of poor folks do better, uh, that's another huge thing that India has that in, uh, is a large and underdeveloped market in Africa. Uh, also, India has world-class financial institutions, uh, including Exim Bank, but uh, some big and very uh, adept financial institutions which can not only support the trade but help to develop their counterparts on the other side of the ocean. So that's another great big opportunity. Uh, I'd say like a lot of things, the idea is clear and it's, uh, it's easy to see the potential, uh, but a little like Jenny was referring to, uh, the execution and the making happen of the individual transactional things is a lot harder than it would seem. 
Uh, one of the reasons is just the matchmaking, uh, other than large trade flows, which are, are happening and could happen more, and really don't depend on a corporate entity on the other side as much. Uh, usually this kind of matchmaking of finding a receiver on the African end of such a trade uh, that'll be sustainable and scalable, that tends to be a problem. And it's a little bit finding a needle in a haystack to match the export of the skills of the business to a receiver in on the African side. So that's one of the reasons I've observed lots of programmatic and, let's say, uh, thought constructs in this that a little bit uh, underachieve in terms of making the actual investment deals happen. I, I think it's to do with just that complication at the transactional level. Uh, the actual enterprise work often needs a lot of support that uh, more than they get and probably more on the African side. But uh, again, the enterprise and the financial and company building end of that as well is uh, often under attended to uh, when the programmatic design goes on. Uh, there's often, very often changes. This is true in many things we do, but the twists in the road, uh, large programmatic constructs tend to get over-designed at the beginning. And the, uh, in the South-South trade, the road has many twists, and sometimes these programs don't uh, have the adaptive ability, something goes wrong, or there's a change needed. Uh, keeping that light on your feet and able to adapt, sometimes I've observed, gets a little under-attended to. And then finally, just drawing out the lessons from the early stage of this and feeding it back into the next round of what gets done is, uh, is a little bit of work to be done there, uh, that feedback loop. Uh, so I, I, it kind of leads to some suggestions or issues that maybe we'll talk about later, which is, I think, being humble and pragmatic and taking a step at a time by just making some, a few new types of things happen. And, uh, and Jenny said it also, don't sort of over-design the program until you see how a little bit of it actually plays out. would be a good suggestion, I think. Uh, again, make sure that the structure set up have the kind of partners that also can adapt, change, bring in others. Uh, and I guess the last thing is, because a lot of this gets done by organizations or public sector institutions, and uh, uh, sometimes that the uh, commercial DNA that you need to make such an institution grow and happen it gets a little bit under attended to also. So I would say those are the main sort of uh, lessons of what I've seen in uh, attempts to do this. Maybe I'll just stop there. And... So Ben, I'll come first to you. Um, so you have you know, seen the African entrepreneurial market quite closely and you've been here at Sankal for two days. Um, what are the stark differences that, you know, uh, what is it that you notice about India that you would say is very different from what you see in Africa? And what are also the similarities that you have seen? I mean, what's your take on that? Um, so I, I think one of the first things that I, I uh, uh, felt when I walked into Senkulp was, wow, I don't remember or I don't seem to have attended a similar event like this anywhere in Africa. Um, so I think there's a lot of energy around uh, the technology space. If you look at mobile, web, things like this. Um, but if you're looking at the size of this community, focus on things like innovations in healthcare, uh, renewable energy, um, water, sanitation, things like this. Uh, I don't think we have such a, a gathering. And I don't think it has such a, a visibility as it does here um, uh, at, at this event. So I think as well, where Africa is ter in terms of accepting social entrepreneurship as, as, a, as, a, as a path uh, to follow as an entrepreneur, I also don't think that there is as wide of an acceptance, uh, and there are possibly different reasons for that. Um, so that, that struck me. I think yesterday we were also talking about unlocking the angel investment space. Uh, it was mentioned that 70 million has been raised uh, last year alone uh, in, in angel investments that were made uh, across India. This is, to me, this is remarkable. So sometimes I'm sitting here thinking, wow, I'm actually looking into the future of where we might be in the African space a couple years from now. Uh, we're now just starting to see the mobilization of the first angel investment networks. We're now starting to see the first, you know, deals that are being made you know, sort of under an official uh, angel uh, umbrella. Um, these things are just starting to happen. So if, if you look at where the Indian space is, I think there's a lot uh, to, to, to recognize and, and to learn from. 
And if I can make that question a little bit more specific, <clears throat> if there was one thing that you think you know is needed, much needed in Africa landscape today, that you saw maybe at Sankalp this time, uh, what's that one linkage that you think is you know most effective to make as of this moment? So I think one of the things that we're working on now as a, as a community is to build that trust. Uh, that entrepreneurs do understand their markets, that they do see a way to tackle very difficult challenges, and that if we offer them the support, we could have a, a similar community like this. So it's building that trust and that confidence, finding those success stories that help to illustrate uh, and understand what, what a beaten path might look like. And I think you, you, you probably have more uh, examples uh, to follow in, in sectors that are otherwise very difficult and complicated to operate in. Okay. So if I can come to you, Mr. Ranganathan, since you are deploying, uh, I believe, almost in excess of $5 billion uh, dollars into Africa, um, what are the regions, what are the regional variations? You know, when we talk about India, Africa, but the truth is that, you know, within Africa, there is East, there is West, there is South, and each of these regions are quite different from one another. Um, so where do you see the most potential? And I know you mentioned Sub-Saharan Africa, but um, where do you see the most potential in terms of you know, information exchange? And also, um, if you can comment on what sectors do you see most of the you know, um, um, export money going to? Where is the most trade that you see today? See if you talk about regional diverse, diversities and cultural similarities, in India, Tamil Nadu and Kerala, the distance is about 100 km, 150 kilometers. And uh, Tamilian and Malayali, the, what they think about each other, same thing happens in Africa. There are 50 odd countries, and each of them is as different from other. Languages are quite different. At times, the countries have been artificially created because of accidents of history, but at times, distance itself plays a role in diversification. As far as the India familiarity is concerned, historically, there are very large pockets of Africa which are English-speaking. There are large pockets which are French-speaking. So getting business going in the French-speaking Ocean, you have a certain language barrier which we are trying to work upon and trying to educate people. In the English speaking zones, it's relatively simpler. In terms of ease of doing business, any entrepreneur who's worked in India where you have 1.2 billion people in a certain kilometer, the intensity of competition is X. If you go to another geography where the same amount of population is in an area 10 times bigger, the intensity of comp competition is dramatically different, much lower. In terms of World Bank indices, ease of doing business, India is far more difficult to do business in than in most places in Africa. But you have, when you are in an emerging market space, you have the concept of particle risk, the fragility of a system, how fragile is, how this and all that. So they are different and we have very intensive guidance, or we have a large research. So what parts of Africa are getting most of your money today? I would say wherever there is, a, we don't give money. We, yeah. If person wants to borrow from us, we lend money. And if he wants to borrow from us, he wants to use Indian goods and services. So the driver is to make Indian goods and services look acceptable to people in different countries. And we work on that. And we work on that first by, we analyze what that country is importing from various parts of the world. And we go up to a categorization called HS6, that is six degrees. We try to match it with Indian, the thing we tell Indian entrepreneurs. Wherever we are successful, growth of Indian imports starts in a bigger way. And we lend, we lend to governments we lend to banks which are going to finance industry and we lend to companies which are investing there. So we have three forms of interventions. Mm -hmm. And in some places it has been more receptive, in other countries it's less receptive. So the degree of receptiveness depends on how 
good we have been in marketing Indian products and services there and how not good we have been. Mm. And as I mentioned, the challenges of the language in some areas, so that language barrier we are trying to breach, but the effort is on. Harold, since you are one of the you know uh, unique investors, even um, at a forum like Sankalp, and you invest both in India and Africa, um, are there any portfolio level insights that you can share with us? Where do you see you know most of the opportun most opportunity? Which sectors work for you in India versus the sectors that work for you in, in Africa? Uh, the question is, which sectors uh, work better in what? which place? Yes. Well, as I mentioned, I, we, I don't know if it's just by accident, probably not, that in Africa there is a large uh, feed the local population issue, and there is actually a lot of arable land, in, and I'm talking here sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, that's a very big potential. Uh, it needs to get developed, and it, there's plenty of the inputs available. I'd say the size of the local markets, and this matters whether it's a trade flow from India or an investment project, uh, there are 55 countries in Africa, and very few of them have what would be a critical mass for a, a real commercial transaction. That's overstating the problem a little bit. There are some. Uh, but the sustainability of a business flow, given the you know, business environment issues which were raised or the infrastructure problems, especially given that the local markets are small, that's a pretty big issue. And you look at the size of the local market in India, it's a very, very different thing. Uh, we've tended, as I said, to do a lot of artisanal organizations. We don't invest usually in the little artisans, but we invest in the larger organizations that support them and market their products and train them and all of that. Uh, that also, you have organizations here that are very, very big and accomplished, uh, and we work with strengthening them further. I'd love to take that model to Africa. Uh, we, again, it, they, they do have a crafts tradition. Uh, the crafts and artisanal business in most African countries is pretty uh, balkanized. And again, when I say all these other inputs that you have in India, like great people and strong financial and business institutions, all of this matters. Uh, so yeah, I would say it's probably in, in Africa, There's a, it's gotta be feeding the people is the first thing to do. I think there's plenty of that that needs to be done here too. But uh, you know, as I said, trade always works best when uh, one side has a relative advantage in one thing. And uh, I think really India has the kind of technical skills to support any industry. But uh, I'd say that sort of bringing some of its model and artisanal work, at least what we're, we would like to do, bring that to Africa. And then meanwhile, bring investment and technical skills over into the agribusiness uh, enterprises in Africa. Jenny, um, you run three chapters in Africa, I believe, and one in India. What are the differences that you have seen? What's the potential for collaboration? How is the you know small business environment really different? And to your building of you know to your point of capacity building, um, what sort of capacity building are we really talking about? You know, because I think uh, we talk about this India example a lot, but um, in my opinion, I think it has evolved organically to in some, uh, some way, you know, there was no science to it. It was more of an art form where market responded, people responded, and now we have an ecosystem that sort of, you know, responds to, uh, that's come together. Um, is it pretty much, do you think, that, you know, some of these lessons can easily be transported, or everybody has to go through some part of that, you know, organic journey on their own? Where do you really see the potential? I think it's a combination of both. Um, so when I think of the differences, so we currently have chapters in West Africa, East Africa, and South Africa, as well as in India. Um, East Africa by far is our largest and most robust chapter. Um, but to Ben's earlier point, I think the difference between East Africa and India is that the majority of the organizations that are working in East Africa right now are international organizations. There, there aren't many, particularly on the investment side, there aren't many local investors um, as compared to the Indian market at least. So I think that's a big distinguishing factor. Um, you know, I think the initial work and what we're really focusing on with each of our chapters is, is first some of the trust building too that, that Ben mentioned and developing that local ecosystem. You know, what we see um, time and time again with Andy members, whether it's globally or regionally, is that often organizations are, are somewhat aware of other organizations who are working in similar space, um, though not always. Oftentimes they don't even know that the other organizations are there um, and that they, they really don't know what the other organizations 
things do. And so one of the things that we've done with each of our chapters is to start to build up that knowledge base and help organizations understand what our other organizations are doing, which is particularly important when you think of the entrepreneurial life cycle, because there are so many different stages of capacity development that an entrepreneur needs, and no one organization provides all of that. Um, but for an organization to know, you know, if, if if a business comes to Grassroots Business Fund looking for investment and they're too small for GBF or GBF to say, you know what, we're not the right partner for you, but you should talk to this organization or go get support from this organization, um, <coughs> excuse me, is really key. Um, where I think there, there's interesting potential sort of for cross-regional learning um, is around some of, uh, of the strategies and sort of different types of intervention. Um, I joke all the time that I feel like I run a dating service um, because so much of what I do and what Andy does is sort of say, hey, you're working on that. You know what? You should talk to this person. So yesterday I introduced one of our members, NEN, to a member out of the U.S. who also runs educational programs in university to say, hey, you're kind of working on the same thing. You should share information. Or I just offered today to introduce uh, an investment fund here to an investment fund in Brazil that's trying to do a similar model. Um, and so I think that's an important piece of it. What we're hoping or what we are doing right now with our, each of our regional chapters, so we currently have staff in four out of six of our chapters. So we have somebody in Nairobi, Johannesburg, Mexico City, and Brazil. Um, and hopefully we'll have somebody soon in India. Um, at least that's the plan. And that we just hired the four international staff last year and we hired them all at the same time and brought them in sort of as a cohort to the Andy team so that they have access to each other um, in addition to sort of our central office in, in DC with the hope of really facilitating that learning of, okay, what's working in South Africa or, you know, I'm doing this event in Brazil and you did something similar in East Africa and, you know, what worked there. And so that's been a great way to start some of this exchange. Um, and what we really want them to be in the long term is a resource so that if we have a member in India, for example, that's working with a business that is ready to start, you know, looking to Africa as a market, you know, they can contact our staff person in Nairobi and say, who should we talk to? Who could be our local partners? Who could be our distribution channels? Who might be interested in investing in this business to expand? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I come back to. I think it's a lot of the role of um, the intermediaries and in the ecosystem to help facilitate that. Um, because again, I think it's challenging for an individual entrepreneur to have that visibility into another market. So Ben, um, you seem like a big fan of uh, online platforms. So do you, <laughs> um, so do you think that, uh, you know, even in India, when entrepreneurs are trying to access information, we find that online platforms are not often the very best way to get information to them because uh, for all that we talk about that, you know, inter internet is all pervasive, information is free, uh, there are a lot of people who, entrepreneurs who are sitting in low-income states and other states that don't have access to that information, they really don't know where to get it. Um, so for all the talk of, you know, uh, an online platform, um, do you still believe that that's the way, uh, you know, that's pretty much the starting point of how we can start the information exchange? Is the landscape any different in Africa is what I'm keen to understand because in India we have a lot of platforms that could possibly help entrepreneurs, uh, but they are not the ones who are accessing these platforms in any meaningful way. So how is that experience different in Africa and um, how will you really do this? You know, if you had to create a corridor of information, um, even to Jenny's point, one is, you know, through intermediaries like Andy who actually work on the ground itself, but do you think that online platform is the answer eventually? So, so I, I don't think there is an answer, um, and I don't think it's about one approach or one strategy or uh, intervention or, or any one thing. So I think it's, you know, an ecosystem has many different parts, and it's the combination of all those parts that starts to create uh, a support structure that actually is, is, can be effective. Um, also, if you look at the current um, funding landscape in, in the African space, there, there are very um, clear gaps in, 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 in that. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's, it's putting all of those different pieces together um, that, that make things work. So, we have uh, many Indian entrepreneurs who are already part of the VC for Africa community and uh, are working to build their ventures in different parts of Africa or are in India and exploring uh, different business opportunities in the African space. I don't know if Neaton is here in the, in the audience. I don't know if he was able to attend the session, but so he's actually working 
um, on a uh, piece of technology uh, that people can use to help basically screen their, their health condition and, and uh, using uh, prescription, smart prescription tools and, and analytics to help inform doctors about the various options that they have in terms of treating their, their patients. Uh, this is an Indian entrepreneur who happens to have a brother living in uh, Jinja in, in Uganda. And his brother is in Jinja and has a uh, manufacturing uh, facility and is producing products for the local Ugandan market. He travels to Uganda several times uh, to visit his brother. And yesterday he was, uh, you know, explaining to me his technology and his interest to find an African partner who would be able to take that technology and implement it into the market. This is someone who, you know, already has uh, a link to the continent has a piece of, of intellectual property that is relevant for an African market, sees a lot of opportunity there. And so this person is, is you know, he's looking for people to connect with um, that he can, he can potentially, you know, do business with. And so it's a, it's a human process. It's people meeting people. It's people finding business partners, a trusted, um, you know, uh, business connections. Uh, and the web and mobile and all of these different technological tools just make that process easier. They make it more efficient um, and, and they make it faster and, and, and easier to connect the dots between supply and demand. And so that's where I feel the web has a, has a role to play. By definition, you have to have access to the internet. So we are talking about a segment of the population. There are large parts of the population who obviously you don't reach through a web platform. Um, but if you look into the future, again, if you, you take into consideration that India will add 30 million people to the Internet this year alone, you see that it's a growing segment. Uh, and you see that that population, certainly at some point, there is a tipping point where, where everyone will be using the web. I think that's one of the other last points that we see is that it's very important for entrepreneurs to get onto the web mm -hmm. if they're not because they connect themselves to the global brain, to the global intelligence. I mean, they can find all of the information that they need is available. So if they're not on the web, it's also about finding ways to encourage them to get involved and to get themselves online because they connect themselves to the rest of the ecosystem and all kinds of resources and partners that they might never have known existed before. Yeah, sure. Um, so I just want to echo actually what Ben's saying about the importance of kind of the online, offline component of it. So we have a group of members in East Africa that are working right now to try and compile all of the resources that exist for entrepreneurs in the region. I mean, there's a whole wealth of resources that entrepreneurs can tap into, whether it's from our members or the government or the SME toolkit, but they have to know where to look, right? And they're very spread out, right. their organizations. So what they're working to do is sort of compile and come up with a directory that you could easily sort of, you know, I'm this kind of business looking for this kind of sport. But that does, again, assume that you have internet access and assumes largely that you speak English. Um, so in parallel to that, what they're looking to do is do a, a sort of road show into more rural, rural areas, starting in Kenya but in other countries, to take this information out to communities who aren't based in Nairobi or Dar and Kampala and sort of hearing about and accessing this information all the time and, and present this um, to them so they're more aware of the opportunity. So I think it needs to be a combination. Yeah. Um, Harold, if I can come to you on... Um, so what will make you know deals happen for you in Africa really because if you look at an Indian impact investing landscape uh, we do have the ecosystem at play here you have all sorts of investors you have angels you have HNIs that come in early and sort of you know prep their investment uh, enterprises for people like you to come in later um, you have the regulatory environment you have the policy uh, people at play you have intermediaries uh, so there's an ecosystem that's evolved here um, and what would it take in Africa to, you know, strengthen that system for you to actually be able to, you know, effectively enter that? Well, there's, um, in my book, it still is the most important first step is make a few good deals happen, which would probably mean <clears throat> take a few African enterprises that are missing a few elements and find them from, you know, all the uh, great skills and financing and things you've got in India, probably along with the business and, uh, uh, try to set some models. Uh, it would be great if some of the models and long-term partners can also be from India, but uh, it's very hard to see how you can make this scale in Africa without drawing in and developing the local ecosystem players and things like uh, the basic accounting and uh, 
people who know how to improve governance in these enterprises or the kinds of things we do out of our nonprofit to help these businesses develop. Uh, you've got lots of it here. Uh, it's, some of it is still at work in terms of developing it as it applies to particular uh, growing businesses here. But as that's, it's better developed and better applied here. So taking some of those models early on, and it'll mean some workarounds in the early stages, like actually bringing the consultants from here. That's a good thing to do too. Uh, but that should be a sort of transitional phase. Maybe using the ecosystem and support players here uh, let's say, to actually develop their counterparts in Africa around the doing of some actual transactions. Uh, that's really what we would like to do. In some of my earlier configurations, and even going back to my IFC days, we did manage to do some of that, but, uh, and I don't think that's a funding problem at all. There's lots of funding for this sort of development in Africa, and uh, one of the big potentials, it's kind of like underdeveloped farmland, You've got so much donor resources that would like to develop these elements, whether it's web-based resources or you know, basic forensic accounting help or uh, uh, you, you've got plenty of it here and you've got plenty of resources to pay for the development of that. But that's where when I said the, the history of why you can have that much money allocated from the aid community and there's still such a shortage is it's that missing business DNA, as I said, and that's where I say somehow grafting that on by having it come from here and train their local equivalents, somehow that's kind of the model that I think is going to make Africa grow on a sustainable basis. Yeah, because I think uh, people talk about, you know, how the ideas and models need to travel, but not necessarily entrepreneurs themselves. Um, get Take the model there, take the idea there, and let the local entrepreneurs do it. Um, but is that... I don't know if it's is that a pipe dream or does it really happen in practical um, you know reasons? Can you really make it work like that, where you just take a model, you just take an idea, and ask a local entrepreneur, or is it more efficient if you also you know take the entrepreneur there and make him do so? The latter, I would say, and it doesn't have to. Obviously, the big Indian groups that are absolutely world class, they're already doing it. The big houses here are setting up. And I always say there's so many human resources and skills and market connections in those groups uh, that the, that's easy. But if the question, a lot of the skills and the ability to work in the kind of SME or SGB space, uh, really it's you've probably got a million of those in India too. And for them, the cost benefit, given what I said about the balkanized market and all the costs uh, of doing business over there, I think that's a really hard sell. Uh, so maybe something for the aid community or donors to do is help to cover some of that transitional cost because it's one thing, uh, you know, Tata or Mahindra or one of those, they are doing it, they can afford to take the long view, but if you could get the sort of, I don't want to say more nimble, but the, the kind of mid-size Indian businesses, which can still be pretty big, to find it worth their while to go over, invest, or help develop ecosystem partners, I think that's a very good thing for the, I would say the kind of place I used to work or the donors to do. Uh, the, as I said before, the, the big trick to doing that is make sure that it doesn't remove the business discipline or the, the businessmen stop caring about it and it's just a trip paid for by, you know, a USAID or the World Bank. And unfortunately, there's a history of a little bit of that too. So, I mean, uh, it's sort of peer-to-peer -peer learning across the two SME sectors and somehow making it worthwhile for the Indian companies to come over and participate, whether it's plunk down an actual investment or just work on developing their counterpart on the other side? So when you were talking about the ecosystem and developing ecosystems and whether to take the entrepreneur across or take the business plan across, if you step back in time, what you see in India just now is an outcome of about 60 years of effort. We, the Indian banking system was asked to go into lending to small businesses and small industries on a standard basis in 1959. And from those pilot things, we have evolved over the period. And the learnings and lessons which we have learned, we have constructed what is there. Exim Bank, one of the activities we do is also capacity building. And we work with partner institutions in Africa to transmit some of the learnings. Recently, we had the occasion to work with Nigeria, the Nigerian Exim Bank. And in Nigeria, like in India, the movie-making industry is a very big thing. Nollywood is a very big center. But banks find it hard to lend because the institutional framework for lending is not there. In India, 
we have been able to successfully lend to movie making things for the last 10 12 years because of a set of policy changes which made it pragmatic and sensible to lend making sure the money will come back to you after you've lent the money and we did this assignment with the nigerian exam bank and we that and also involved educating the central bank of nigeria and the government of nigeria was very interested about how to make those policy changes there so that Nigerian banks and institutions could lend to Nigerian movie makers commercially sensible loans. And we are doing this with a number of various countries. We have worked in Mauritius, we have worked in, I think, Zimbabwe, we have worked in Zimbabwe. So these type of learnings we transmit across. Do you also share learnings uh, around, so see some of the times uh, SMEs don't get a lot of access to finance, not just equity capital, debt capital as well, because there are no um, assessment frameworks, for instance. You know, how do you really do risk assessment of a business? So in that sense, I think India has come a little bit, you know, of a long way where we know how to assess a business exactly to, you know, ensure that the funding is unlocked for an entrepreneur. Do you also do that kind of uh, knowledge exchange and information? Yes. In fact, we do that in a variety of ways. You know, the word is also rather a 30,000 feet high level word. If you use the word SME in US, it covers enterprises with 50 million capital investment in other things. In Europe, it's 50 million euros. In India, it's less than $2 million. So, what SME is like thing. And in India, what we have done, as I mentioned over the thing, we have stratified even the $2 million into various segments. And we have the micro and we have the thing on that. And for each, the pattern of assessment and the pattern of securities and the pattern of lending has to be different. And you need to make sure that what you are lending, you are going to get your money back. And we have these training programs and we train African bankers, partner investing. We are we've got equity investments in four or five African things. That is, I think Africa Exim, we have got Bank of African Development, we have got Development Bank of Zambia, we've got one or two others. Plus, we give lines to them to they, when they will lend to them. So, if they are interested in a training, we organize. We have a training system in Exim Bank of India, and we have these organize these workshops. Capacity building in terms of you know working with uh, the banks and building their capacity. How do you work with the entrepreneurs in India to tell them what is really what does Africa market really need? You know, how do you make that trade happen? You see, we have a very large research group. And I do country research with a fair amount of data. We are subscribed to very various data bases. that meet? For instance, you know, are there exposure tips for Indian businessmen to see yeah, what's so, the opportunity for African yeah, so businessmen Suppose when you talk about Africa, then you have to do, within Africa, you take a particular country. What is the country doing? What is it buying? What is it selling? That comes the first. When you talk to an entrepreneur, if he's going to sell something or buy something, there must be a market for it. Is that country buying that in commercially sensible amounts? If it is importing something in commercially large amounts, then it maybe makes sense to produce it there. Below a certain level, it is not commercially sensible to produce it there. So now this requires very detailed analysis of a country's import practice of that. And our research teams do these exercises. When an Indian company or entrepreneur wants to know about a particular country, we tell them about all these details. Then is the business environment framework that how much, what is the banking system there like? How many banks have this mandated lending? Like in India, we have a priority sector lending. In Africa, they have not gone there. Because you know what happened when Africa, there is, India learned this the very hard way because in the 50s and the 60s and 70s, we were more or less what you call outcasts because we were, what they call the basket case and people are not willing to either. So we had to literally remake everything ourselves. So priority lending concepts and all that also came in and banks were asked to do that and on a standalone basis. There, the staircases have not come up in Africa. You know, the elevators have been installed, the staircases are not there. So you have banks there, which are the modern Euro European type banks, which do these hi-fi investment banking and equity, this thing, but not the down below, cap hand-holding gloves, this thing on there. 
basic lending, basic monetary, they don't do, and they don't do it as a part of a mandated balance sheet. So in India, 30, 40% of our bank books of all the public sector banks is to the priority sector. Mm -hmm. So perforce, the skill sets have developed across banks, across offices, across branches on how to lend to a small business. It is, un if you're doing it on a voluntary basis, the skill sets don't develop. So the skill sets in Africa are not there because it is not a mandated lending in a number of places. Wherever it is possible that they'll get loans, we tell the Indian companies that you will get loans. Wherever it is that we, we, sometimes we give a loan line to a bank there that you lend to Indian companies which are, or buying companies which are in. So we have to work in various varieties of manners depending on how that country is situated and what kind of a system that country has. What are the tax systems they have? What are the import regulations? What are the tax regulations? What are the movement regulations? Because quite a few of them have got movement restrictions or there are geographical impediments in movements and the markets are not, as Arul was saying, the markets are not often large enough. If there are transport barriers between two cities, then the two markets are different. So all those things come into that, and we do that type of advice also. Okay. Jenny, you wanted to add something to <laughs> Okay. Um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up to um, the audience, if you have any question for the panelist. Yes. It's not exactly, all right. So it's not exactly a question, more of a, um, a point of discussion. So my name is Manuela, I work um, with EDGE and we attract and develop talent amongst, amongst emerging markets to social business. And uh, I've lived in East Africa for a good three years, so this is very interesting for me to hear. Uh, and I see a lot of potential for, um, you know, I see a lot of similarities coming from Europe between East Africa and India. And I mean, you've said a lot of very good things. The policy is, do entrepreneurs know about the realities in each other's markets? Knowledge, how can we give platforms where people can read? But to me, when I see these four last words up there, collaborations between Africa and India, I think a lot of per about perceptions, about history, and what do people in Africa and India, and vice versa, you're nodding, you're nodding, right? What do people think about each other, and do they want to work with each other? And what type of patience do we have to work with these perceptions and with exchanging? Um, in the end, this, people are going to make this happen, right? So what do people think about each other, do they want to work with each other? And um, EDGE, our organization, and I see this year also IDEX, the fellowships, they've started really working on, can young people from Africa work in social business in India? What do they learn? What can they take back? Um, I'd also like to point out that we have around seven African faces at this event, right? And around 100 white faces. And I mean, it's always this thing that if I go to East Africa to an event, I have a hundred white faces and three Indian faces. And look at the world map. It's 28 hours flight from the West Coast, from San Francisco to India, but it's six hours flight over the Indian Ocean. So I mean, I think what's gonna make this happen is people going back and forth wanting to get to know each other. This is how you do business. So I just like to invite people who feel they're also passionate about this, also to talk to me, because um, we'd like to scale up our operations between um, between especially East Africa and India in the future of bringing talent back and forth. Right now I'm looking for an Indian to work in a social business in Uganda and it's been really hard. So, you know, this is what, what I'm dealing with. So, I mean, um, just want to kind of bring that in. Thanks. Thanks. Actually, that brings me to a question which I want to pose to panelists and, you know, any one of you can take this. Um, so she's talking about, you know, how people will want to work with people eventually. Um, and I kind of come in with a little bit of a different view. Do we need to make markets work? And then, you know, do we need to have the free market principle at work here, where if the markets work, people will go there? Or is it the other way, that, you know, people need to work with people and develop those markets eventually? Do you guys have a view one way or other? Uh, I think our friend Neetan, the entrepreneur example that I gave earlier, will probably speak to many different entrepreneurs until he finds one that uh, is speaking the same language. And at that moment, you know, they'll be able to, uh, to make an agreement and, and to formalize their business. It could be um, a fellow Indian entrepreneur who happens to be living in Zambia. It could be um, a local Zambian. It could be, um, 
you know, someone from Germany who's living in Zambia? I have no idea. But, you know, those conversations will happen until he finds a click, and, and, and that's how uh, I think these things come together. So it's, you know, people at the end of the day, and I think exchanges like this um, are very useful because people need to be talking to each other until they find, uh, you know, the people that, that they can communicate with and, and find uh, a level of understanding. Anyone wants to add to that? Yeah, I think it's actually a fair point that there's markets that do work now, and if you look back at... I'm no uh, economic historian, but if you look back 200 or 300 years, I think America was a place people said it was just a resource outpost, it couldn't produce anything there, and it was just a place that, you know, far away, that uh, you know, a place to send criminals or uh, buy resources from. And there was a time 50 or 100 years ago when a little bit India was seen as maybe a place for resources and trade, uh, and that worked, but uh, to produce things here was also seen as either uneconomic or difficult, and for sure India's gotten over that issue. In a way, I think we're saying Africa right now maybe is viewed a little bit like that. So what the market that's gonna work in Africa right now is probably trade, and that's a great sort of, uh, if I call it a Trojan horse or something to get in with, but to think ahead a little bit about how we can use that to evolve the actual investment. As I always say, you can sell things to poor people, but at some point you're gonna to have to create some wealth there for them to be good, sustainable customers uh, so I think it's, uh, I say, uh, somewhere there has to be somebody who can step up and help the investment happen, maybe a little bit before it's actually fully economically viable and maybe fix the investment environment around that. By the way, for that, I saw one of my former colleagues walk in and I have to put in a plug. There's few people in the world who's done as many sort of investments in company buildings, both in Africa and India, as Anil Sinha, who's, uh, Anil, did he just walk in? I He's, saw him oh, walk in. Sorry, he just walked in and walked out. But anyway, he has a bit of a gig now for the World Bank Group to actually pursue this exact point of creating enterprises and doing the South-South trade. So I would you know, suggest that that's a place where such agencies can do a really good job of, let's say, getting over that hump that uh, really the only thing that makes full sense right now is to sell things. And I just think that's a very, it's a little bit short-sighted and limiting that uh, the market that worked today is probably not how that's going to look in 10 or 20 years, and you have to start, you know, investing into it early. Other questions? Yes. Um, so I have a comment and then a question. Um, I see myself as an African, and um, I see Africa as a continent and not a country. So most times I'm not very comfortable when um, talks about Africa. It's like a country context as against a content context. Because it's a, conti it's a continent with like 53 countries and um, with varying kind of people and culture. So for any investment to come in, they have to understand the history of the people. Because like India is a country and so you understand the history of the country. But Africa is a continent made up of different countries, languages and way of life. And that is very important to understand. And so um, I'm, I'm very concerned about the grassroots um, level because I've worked with a non-profit space and profit space in Nigeria. And um, I understand that a lot of things are going on, but it's more like on the policy level and on the managerial level. But the people that need to be impacted are the people on the grassroots level. And those people have relatively no information. So how do you get to the grassroots? How do you make them understand that I am working for you and I'm working with you instead of just at the policy level, at the international level. Everybody says, we've done this in Africa, but they're not pointing at which country in Africa have you done this and what have you done in that region of the African country? Thank you. No, thank you. I quite agree with you. As I mentioned in my opening thing, in Exim Bank of India, we don't see Africa as a country, we see it as a continent. And we don't see capacity building as installing an elevator. We see capacity building as building a staircase. And staircase takes time to build. And therefore, you need someone to do the building in a particular country. And Exim Bank of India has programs where we work with partner banks in various countries for capacity building in a specific niche area in which that institution is interested. And depending on the niche which that institution picks up, we do capacity building in form of sharing whatever we have learned 
during the course of the last 20, 30 years it is a part of the development experience in India. By bringing in former bankers or former instructors or former things from various institutions and organizations in India to offer that to that bank in that country. And we have recently worked with Nigerian Export Bank in Nigeria for one aspect. And we can work with other banks in Nigeria if they show that inclination in any other aspect which they would like to do, including working with social enterprises. We have a large called wealth of experiences of how to deal with social enterprises, how do you risk mitigate, how do you evaluate a social enterprise, how much is, should be your risk exposure on them, how much should you do hand-holding, where should an institution like Harold's come in to invest in that, when should it not come in, all those things also we do and I think we have learned a lot from IFC in his previous avatar, he was in the IFC and they did capacity building for us. So that we have internalized and we are now transmitting across. So anyone who's interested, they can take advantage of that. Thank you. Jenny, do you have a response? Yeah. I'll just add to that, that I, you know, for us the end game is about building local capacity and local ecosystems. Um, so when we think about trying to build out the entrepreneurial ecosystem, you know, our hope in the long run is to have local accountants, local lawyers, local investors, local capacity development providers that are supporting entrepreneurs and that are cycling back into that process, right? So a successful entrepreneur becomes an angel investor, becomes a mentor and whatnot. Um, so I think a lot of it is a, is a training and capacity development issue. So to the point Manuela was making about, you know, providing training opportunities to people who might work in the sector. Um, it's interesting, we run an investment manager training course that we've done, I guess, five times now around the world. And every time we do it, so we actually did it in India in 2011, and we had somebody come from Nigeria and somebody come from Kenya. Um, so the exchange that happened there of, you know, sort of what are the strategies that have worked in their markets that may or may not apply to the markets, um, you know, the Indian market, or we just did one in Brazil and somebody came from South Africa, um, is really interesting, and, and we're about to do one in Nairobi, and so hopefully we'll get a sort of pan-African participation, but also an international participation as well, because I think it's a unique opportunity to do that exchange, but people often say to me, you know, why don't you do this course in Washington, D.C.? That's where we're based. It'd be a lot cheaper. There are a lot of organizations based in the U.S. who would come, and I always push back on that and say, you know, my priority is not developing the capacity of a bunch of white investment fund managers. I want to be developing the capacity in the countries where these investments are happening, um, and so I think the more we can think about the developing those types of training programs and, and educating um, local talent about how to inter how to participate in this field as well. Um, it's interesting. Yesterday, I, or someday this week, they're all blending together. <laughs> but I was talking again with NEN about the work that they've been doing in universities here to help create a culture of entrepreneurship, um, which was really interesting to me because in December, Manuela and I were both part of a conversation in Kenya about the challenge that the Kenyan market sees because graduates in universities graduate with sort of three options. They can go work at Barclays or, or uh, KCB or Price Waterhouse, and that's sort of the only opportunities that are pre presented to them. So starting to think about how do you teach a culture of entrepreneurship in universities, and so taking that learning that's been happening in, in India and seeing if we can apply some of that to the African context as well. Okay. Yeah, hi, my, my name is Kiran, and uh, my company's name is Idobro. Uh, we work with women's social green enterprises, and we help to take them to markets. Uh, you know, investment is, of course, capital is obviously something that is very critical and capacity to an extent, you know, you learn and live and kind of build on that. But ultimately, market access, you know, getting the consumer, because that's the proof of the, you know, pudding, so to speak, is so difficult. And yet, our biggest challenge is that we can never find a budget in any enterprise that says, okay, you know, uh, forget about research and development, that's like too far. But even for basic things like promotion and communication, you know, they would not have a budget. So how do you help them and how, how can we ask investors, please encourage that, you know, you keep some um, allocations for marketing because that's, I think everybody knows it's important and everybody agrees we need to do it. 
development, but it is never really seen. And I know that many people, and I've met trade delegations from Africa, and uh, they have seen our work and our model, what we're doing with our uh, members, and they always say, like, this is so great, you know, I wish I could take you to Africa to help us with other things. And obviously it's because there are no budgets. And so one of the things I do is I give them all our material and say, please go replicate it. We really, uh, you know, don't worry about There's no IP related with this. Just go ahead. But, I mean, as investors and as people who encourage enterprises, I just wanted to understand what do you think on the market access front. Thank you. It's an excellent point, and you're absolutely right. And maybe I spent too long in the development institution, but I have a particular phobia about, let's say, going after a specific uh, either social or developmental or green cause. Uh, we, I'll say we collectively tend to put too much emphasis on let's just go after that, and we forget that the only way those kind of things happen sustainably is through a business supply chain or being a market or a producer chain tied into a viable company. Uh, so I say... Uh, I don't I particularly like, and I used to run plenty of both donor-funded and investment facilities where we had people telling us, go help disabled people, or go help women, or go help particular segments. And the only way we ever did that I thought really went to scale and worked was when that was all tied into a viable business structure. Now, there's nothing wrong with putting a little bit of capacity building into making that happen, but what I think what happens is because the that kind of money comes from either charitable or nothing wrong with faith-based organizations, but the kind of people who will do that usually, again, are detached from the business supply chain, and that usually ends up badly. So it's not that I'm against, and I think I had a pretty good record of helping a lot of groups that, you know, including the ones you're mentioning. Uh, but I always said, you know, I really want to focus in on, is it tethered into a business that's going to be viable? And if I'd rather be transparent about the need for that has to be subsidized for a period, but make the subsidy in, towards building a viable supply chain into which the groups you're trying to reach are, are helped. I would like to add to one point which Harold mentioned. He, what he talked is basically what marketing implications are. And there are two ways of marketing. That is you go out and hunt for markets or you bring the market to the other thing. And Exim Bank is trying to do the second part. We organize these Africa conclaves and we do it with both CII and with FIKI, and they are held annually. And the CII conclave was held about in March, end March, and we had about seven heads of state, 40 minister-led delegations, and over 900 delegates from Africa who came for that. And we would invite any, everyone from India is seeing, and you can set up stalls there, and it's all around the thing on there, and you have got that opportunity of intersecting with very high-powered teams on entrepreneurs from Africa. That is one, and you can take advantage of both the FIKI and the CII. Second, I urge all social business or commercial enterprises that if you try to do anything on your own, then you get run into all the costs and implications what Harold was talking about. The thing is to, how to average out the costs. So this sunk cost, co Convention, unconvention, or whatever you call it, is one way of it. And if you organize a convention here, directed on social business, people from other places would also come automatically, and your cost of information dissemination or market entry would come down. So, encouraging such conventions or unconventions or such marketplaces are good. Clustering is the alternate way of the thing. If ten of social organizations like you get together and organize a function or a show or a demonstration, you'll find people coming up or you can get this. So that is one way which you should look at positively. And if Sankalp can have these stalls and all that in a bigger way, I saw some stalls here when I came and I spent some time there. Maybe you can give more space to these people. Kiran to, to is an old association of ours and <laughs> I'm hoping that you get an artist. I'm not talking about uh, marketing ourselves. We, uh, 
Thank you. Of course, uh, with Sankalp and a lot of other uh, things, we are doing a lot of work and I hope we can get a chance to talk to you about it. I am talking about these smaller enterprises that they don't get that chance because they don't, un one is they don't understand the value perhaps and second is because they're not allowed to spend the money. As Harold just said, that allocation itself is not something that people will be comfortable with. They would be like, no, 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 word of mouth will do or, you know, no, no, there's no need, you know, make it and someone will maybe buy it. But, you know, nobody's really going to go develop a market. And that's where I'm saying as investors who are into encouraging entrepreneurship, if you could also emphasize along with capacity building the value of marketing, it will make my job that much more easier to have it done. <laughs> Thank you. But I think Harold put it very well, you know, marketing is important, but how much you spend on that, this thing should be proportional to your size of your that. Thing. And I think what he sums up the extent wisdom on that subject, I don't think we should add to what he has said. Ma'am, if you had a question. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tammy and I'm with the IDEX Fellowship. Um, and my question has to do with much of the discussion that's been going on. Um, you were talking about linkages and collaborations, but I believe a lot of the discussion has been about the ways um, India can help Africa. Are there any ways that Africa can help India, can India benefit any way from Africa? Um, and also, historically, the linkages with, um, between Africa and the international uh, market has been sort of, they, they've been the problem for Africa's development. How do we avoid those same linkages, those same one-way linkages where there's only one side benefiting? Um, and a lot of the discussion has been sort of how Af uh, India can help Africa and sort of benefit, sort of uh, the business opportunities that's in Africa or India. Um, and I'm sort of nervous that a lot of the social impact will be lost in, in that process. So how can so, sort of Africa be, um, how can we avoid the, the unbalanced linkages that, that, that could arise with, those sort of, with that sort of mindset if we're not really focused on actual social impact in Africa? So that's my question, thank you. By the way, it's, a, it's an excellent point, and you're absolutely right. There are already models in Africa that ought to be taken up here. I, just one that springs to mind that I've worked with for a long time is something called Business Partners in South Africa, which is probably the biggest and most accomplished SME investor on the face of the planet. Uh, we've tried, and uh, in fact, I think I saw Anil. I have to complete this plug for Anil here. Anil, I gave you a big plug when you were out of the room, but this is Anil. If any of you really have things to do in uh, Africa, the South South, this is the guy to talk to. But really, I mean, he knows all the story of business partners, for instance, if, and we've done that, we've brought business partners to other parts of the world. It's a world-class model. It's, you know, we don't think of it that way. Uh, we often think of Africa as a receiver of assistance or trade flows or something else. Uh, you have also, and again, this will track to the larger African countries, but in Nigeria, you've got some pretty world-class companies and institutions, and they're hardy because it's a tough operating environment. I always find that's a very good thing when you find businesses that have been able to grow and strengthen in a, given all the challenges they face. I think that's a, again, it may not look like it's on their radar screen or maybe they need a little help. So maybe, uh, you know, it's an excellent point. The South-South could flow the other way and it just means some of us who maybe are positioned to look in both directions or have resources in both need to think of it that way. I think it's a great point. I can just add one point. I can give you one concrete example where India benefited from learning from Africa and is still in the process of fully doing it. That's in the form of mobile banking, cell banking. The regulatory framework in India did not permit extensive use of cell phone as a banking instrument. Whereas in Kenya and other places, it had reached a fairly advanced stage. And the reverse lobbying by Indian banks to the, our regulator here that you should learn from the thing we have progressed and some deregulation has taken place in the last one, one and a half years and the efforts are still on. And that is one place where the African regulatory system is far in advance of what it is in India. It facilitates convenience banking in a far more thing and the effort in India is, Indian banks is to get our regulators to permit up to that level. So that is one concrete example I can tell you straight. Yes. Okay, thank you. My names are Geoffrey Muigai, and uh, I have four questions. You as investors, 
aliyo aware that their customers they are willing customers but beyond their reach that's one the other thing is that they are customers who copy to invest to the third one is i you expecting to shift from capital cities to the rural most of the companies head offices are in the capital city yet i'm um, in rural so i can't manage to reach them the other thing or the fourth one is uh, those customers who believe and trust that education is expensive may i give an example a few farmers who heard that i'm coming all the way from kenya to this place just to learn something some of them thought that i was a millionaire or a billionaire they did not put that they did not put into consideration that ed- learning or educating others learning from others or educating from others sorry learning from others or educating others means a lot there for you people what plans are you having those are my four questions uh, and before i sit may i elaborate a bit on uh, about the the willing beyond my reach it's me let me give myself as an example there are good people who are willing to do business especially let me give an example in agriculture where i concentrate i'm willing to have some daily kettles but when i go to the bank they loan me their money with conditions so it is beyond my reach i want to plant some maize but the condition that i'm being given by the bank is beyond my reach that's what i'm saying there are those customers who are willing but beyond their reach thank you so um i think we had a few questions there and uh, one of the questions perhaps saral you can answer is um, when you think of investments are you thinking beyond big cities and you know going rural and reaching out to you know other um, parts of africa i guess that was one of the large questions you had A uh, quick answer is yes, so given our mandate about creating wealth and lifting people out of poverty through business, it follows that uh, and that's part of probably why we're so focused on agriculture in Africa. Again, this may sound a little bit like what bothers you about the kind of business that goes on, but even we have to worry now about servicing investors, so that means usually investing in an enterprise, which is something like it's almost always a nucleus estate and a marketing operation that has 5 or 10,000 rural farmers. I'd love to be able to finance the farmers directly but what we really need is enterprises who can provide seed financing markets for the farmers and to del- deliver that whole package of inputs you were referring to through a viable business and it's probably true what you're saying that the way the financial institutions are and it's not just in Africa in many emerging markets they're limited they only evolve sort of a little after the needs bankers do what bankers do for a reason i mean i was one also and uh, they may not look like good reasons but rather than fight that and frankly i always say you know don't pick battles you're not going to win in that case uh, i'd say like what exim bank to develop let's say a little more nimbleness of the financial institutions to stretch and do like it does so it can actually reach out to 10,000 artisans through an, uh, an agricultural enterprise i think that's the best we're going to do So you know it's uh, it's why we have like almost everything we've done in Africa so far is lots of farmers who are getting help through an enterprise and who will finance that enterprise we're doing it as sort of a band-aid job and to try to grow the enterprise to where it can get local financing and I think there's hope for Indian financial institutions like again like Exim to develop and they're doing this develop those African institutions so that they can bring those kind of agricultural enterprises and uh to scale and provide good financing to the agricultural people because again a big part of the problem is even if we develop 
the agricultural processing and marketing organizations, you still got the problem of who's going to finance the small farmers. And for all the talk of microfinance, usually between the cost and the tenor, that kind of financing usually isn't very appropriate for crop and cycle. So that's, I mean, that's a long-winded answer to your question. It may sound a little disappointing, but it, it goes back to this building viable businesses that, that are for profit but happen to have a big social impact rather than saying, let's help these guys through, you know, let's say, uh, direct intervention. And then when that program's over, you don't really have a business that sticks and that can grow on its own, I think. Yeah, I, th I think maybe just adding one small point to that is that as entrepreneurs, you know, he's given a very specific example of, of you know, what the picture looks like um, for an organization uh, like his to, to be able to engage. And so as entrepreneurs, we have to look at those models and we have to try and see, you know, where do we fit into that picture? What do we have and what are we missing? And identifying the areas that are missing, um, that's where you can seek out collaboration to try and, and form a full picture so that you actually uh, are able to, to get those conversations with the financiers and, and the bankers, et cetera, who you need at the end of the day to, to move the, the operations forward. So I think that's, that's always a challenge, but we're seeing more and more people looking for combinations um, and, and coming together with, with various aspects of, of the picture that, that make it uh, a viable as an investment opportunity. Um. Thank you. Just one I would like to add to what Exim Bank of India also is involved across countries. You know, it's not only the urban areas, but also rural areas. In fact, almost one third of our loans have been to the rural segments of this thing. In Senegal, we were involved because the government of Senegal wanted the rice cultivation things to be modernized and improved. And we did a fair amount of financing there and the Senegal rice production went up by almost 40%. Second stage of that is there. In Mali, we have worked. In Sudan, we have worked. So depending on, we have done, we have set up what we call the tractor assembly units in two or three countries in Af Tanzania, and I think in some other countries in Africa. And these are all often in the non-urban centers. Depending on the interest shown by the concerned government and the country which wants the intervention and if depending on how receptive are they and what they want we respond to that we don't originate anything the or investing community originates a lending sector responds to a request so we respond but almost a third of our balance sheet is there uh, i'm being told that we have to wrap up unless it's a really burning question that you have one last question burning oh. so we have two burning questions so <laughs> Okay. You do uh, realize that um, this panel is between you and lunch, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Go on. Hi, uh, this is Aditya here. So I had a question which uh, was actually discussed among the panelists. So for creating something like a student community of innovators and facilitating them, which is uh, a very uh, uh, unsustainable model in terms of uh, investment, when an investor seeks at investing in such a model, he sees more than 70% uh, of loss rather than any profit that he might gain out of it. So how can we make such models more sustainable? As Jenny exactly pointed out, that NEN is doing a great job, but they are actually having a tough time keeping it sustainable and uh, scaling it up. So how can such models be uh, uh, more uh, replicable or scalable? I mean, I think I, I got it. How do you make um, models that are trying to train students to be entrepreneurs sustainable? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that there is a sustainable sort of for-profit business model for that because, as you said, you know, investing in sort of a student-led led business probably has pretty low returns, um, at least initially. I think there's a huge opportunity for philanthropic and donor money. And to Harold's earlier point, um, you know, I, I know that a, large of the big, a lot of the big donor um, organizations are interested um, in youth training, broadly speaking, um, but particularly in entrepreneurship. And so m my gut, and I am not an expert on this, would be that you know, a, a sort of donor-driven or philanthropic model is probably the more sustainable. But. See, we have been working, collaborating with IIT Chennai 
and they have these incubator. And our learning from that is that it becomes viable, these incubatory platforms become viable with scale. And the, as you become, make it slightly bigger and bigger, it, oh, there, but initially you require an owner and the owner has to be an institution which is our non-for-profit, so an IIT or an IIM, and then the scale comes in. Once a certain scale comes in, then institutions like us partner with that academic institution to lend to the incubators at the same because a certain trial testing this thing has come about and a lot of costs are absorbed by the institutions themselves. So I think it's an interplay of that. Thanks. Uh, and this has to be the very last thing. Okay, and uh, my question will be more of a comment anyway, so I don't want to keep you from your lunch either. Um, uh, I've been working with people from the open source development uh, community and they're building softwares that have uh, very um, sophisticated tagging systems uh, which make it possible to build uh, map applications which are interactive mapping systems um, that uh, make information that is taggable situated to location uh, searchable by virtue of uh, information filters across various forms of uh, uh, informational basis, location, occupation, so on and so forth. Um, uh, so the panel on the, the people at SOCAP uh, who developed the SOCAP Europe conference and the SOCAP conferences in California are also working with uh, teams of these developers on bioresilience tools um, to create uh, an informational infrastructure for um, the uh, uh, well, for, for the impact space and for uh, the entrepreneurship space. Um, these are ways to link not only people within the impact and entrepreneurship space together, but people within the cultural space, within the open source programming spaces, within o uh, open source development uh, and everything that goes with that. Um, there is something there that's, uh, that's about to tip that is very, very important in terms of information exchange and what it does. My own position is in the background of complex adaptive systems and I've looked at how technologies create increases in information exchange which cause social upheaval and changes in the methods of organization that work in societies as in the printing press changes from the feudal system towards the nation state now the internet changes from the nation state towards a network and market-based uh, mode of global uh, organization I think that the, these are areas that uh, are worth focusing on because they take a lot of stress off the upper echelons of, uh, of, of I suppose, centralized uh, responsibility, centralized uh, wealth, and so on and so forth, and are worth looking into. That's all I wanted to say. Maybe just real quick. Have you been, uh, have you been to Nairobi? I've never been to Nairobi. I've never been to Africa. I'm lucky to be here. Ah, you should go to Nairobi. You'd love it there because you're going to find lots of people who are talking about the same things. So there's, I think there's a growing community of people who, who see the opportunity in these spaces and are working on these questions. And, and indeed, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of innovation um, coming from, the, from this space, particularly. And, uh, and, and that will be uh, increasingly visible and, and part of the way that, that we do our work. So, uh, yeah, exciting. Yeah, open APIs on any software that's built so that the information from it is pluggable into other software is very, very important. Okay. I agree. Great. So with that, we'll close the panel. And uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists for um, the great insights and the information that you shared and all the audience for keeping us honest. And I particularly like your question that why was it that only India can share? Why can't Africa share? So keeping us honest, thank you for that. And um, the panelists are around. And you know we are all around. If you have more burning questions, please feel free to get in touch with them. Um, with that. Thank you for being here today. We have tokens of appreciation for all of you. And uh, for our audience, if there are other questions, feel free to uh, catch the panelists over lunch. <laughs>